Thank you for listening to the national award-winning TRS Journal Club podcast. I'm happy to present your hosts, Drs. Lily Mundy, Raj Parikh, and Kyle Sena. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the February 2019 edition of PRS Journal Club Podcast. I am Kyle Sanek, PRS Resident Ambassador from UT Southwestern, and I am joined today by my co-resident ambassadors, Lily Mundy from Duke University and Raj Parikh from Washington University in St. Louis. Today, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Ash Patel, Associate Professor in Chief of the Division of Plastic Surgery at Albany Medical Center. Thank you so much, Dr. Patel, for joining us for this PRS Journal Club Podcast. Thank you, Kyle. The articles that we will be discussing can be read for free on prsjournal.com, including an archive of all past Journal Club articles. The article we will be discussing today is the utility of preoperative arteriography for free flap planning in patients with chronic lower extremity wounds. It's out of Georgetown University by senior author Karen Evans. The purpose of the study was to determine whether routine preoperative uh, catheter arteriography could identify vascular pathology, guide recipient vessel selection, and become a standard part of their pre-op planning protocol. And so they designed the study with a retrospective review of all chronic lower extremity wounds that had free tissue transfers from 2014 to 2017. The imaging guided vessel selection primarily, but the authors also evaluated the angiography results for vascular pathology, flap outcomes, amputation rates, and then correlated abnormal arteriography studies with their outcomes. A total of 57 patients underwent pre-op angiography for 59 free flaps. Two-thirds of them had chronic osteo, and more than half were diabetics. Two-thirds of the patients had angiographic abnormalities, and more than a quarter required endovascular intervention. But more concerning still was the fact that 15% of patients were newly diagnosed with peripheral vascular disease based on these arteriography studies alone. The FLAP survival rate was 98%, but ultimately 10% of the patients required amputations for reasons ranging from infection to limb ischemia. And I think this study sheds light on a very difficult patient population. The chronic lower extremity wounds are notoriously difficult to heal as the patient's comorbidities that led to them developing a chronic lower extremity wound make the reconstructions tenuous at best. I wasn't surprised so much that two-thirds of patients had angiographic abnormalities as the comorbidities the patients have make one assume their vessels are going to have issues. But in my experience, normally these patients who are seeing us with chronic wounds already have a diagnosis of peripheral vascular disease. And I found it interesting that 15% of the patients in the study were newly diagnosed with peripheral vascular disease from this protocol alone. I think one of the overlooked data points in this study is the fact that 51 of the 57 patients had an endocyte anastomosis, and while more technically demanding, I think this played a role in their improved flap survival and outcomes. This is an important concept, and while the authors only briefly mentioned steel phenomenon, any microsurgeon who has had to learn that painful lesson in real time knows the importance of endocyte anastomosis. And I think if you're going to tackle chronic lower extremity wounds, being facile with these ways to preserve inflow to the extremity is critically important. And the idea of steel phenomenon is something the young microsurgeon should always have in the back of their mind. Lastly, a third of patients had no evidence of lower extremity pathology and arteriogram. So in essence, they underwent an invasive and unnecessary radiation dose. The cost associated with these procedures is not insignificant and the risk of angiography is real. The author mentions a bunch of different comorbidities with an increased risk of abnormal angiographic results, and perhaps the next stage of their study would focus on which constellation of symptoms should be used to guide invasive testing. But even with a third of patients having no pathology, the surgeon is still able to use the anatomic information gained from the arteriography to guide vessel selection for the recipient site. So I picked this article because I think treatment of lower extremity wounds with free flaps, specifically the chronic wound, is very challenging, and the more data you have when planning your surgery, the more prepared you are. So Dr. Patel, briefly, what is your pre-op workup for lower extremity wounds? Do you use imaging? Do you use clinical exam, lower extremity Allen test? Do you have a different pathway for an acute traumatic wound versus a chronic wound? Does it matter on their comorbidities? How do you approach the lower extremity wound? I think the acute traumatic wounds are very different from these chronic lower extremity wounds. Just briefly talking about the acute traumatic wounds, we have to obviously be worried about acute vascular injuries and we often have metallic hardware. So you know, in terms of getting a, a good roadmap for what recipient vessels we have available to us, I nearly always get a formal angiogram on those patients. In terms of the chronic lower extremity wounds, Many of them, as you mentioned, have a risk for chronic arterial disease, or they, they may have already had that diagnosis. There are going to be some patients who have chronic osteomyelitis, maybe with a history of traumatic injury, 
So when I see these people, I try and take a step back and say, even if you already have a diagnosis of a particular disease process, I'm going to evaluate your wound as if no one's ever seen it before and try and figure out what could have been the underlying etiology or or what multiple factors could be related to this wound. I nearly always make sure we've got recent ankle brachial indexes and pulse volume recordings in their lower extremity. And frequently we have a very big and busy vascular group in Albany here. They may have already been seen by the vascular surgeons and have an ABI that's what they would consider acceptable, which may be something like 0.8, but in the setting of a chronic lower extremity wound, that may not be good enough. And so I always look at those ABIs and the PVRs as well, which are important in a diabetic patient, the pulse volume recordings. And if there's any abnormality that I see on those, then I'm gonna wanna get some further vascular imaging. If they're abnormal, I typically push for a formal angiogram because that enables some kind of arterial intervention to be performed at the same time. If the patient's got any indwelling hardware, then I'm also gonna get a formal angiogram versus a CT angiogram. In all of these patients, if I think they're gonna need a free flap, I typically get some kind of vascular imaging because I do want that roadmap of the vessels. I do wanna know, even if they have palpable pulses, that that palpable pulse distally is because of good anagrade flow and not because of retrograde flow and they don't have some kind of vascular either anomaly in terms of uh, the usual anatomy or an atretic vessel or something like that that's allowing for retrograde flow. So that enables me to kind of pick my uh, recipient vessels before we get into the operating room. Thanks, Dr. Patel. Lily, what do you all do at Duke for your uh, preoperative imaging for lower extremity wounds? A large portion of our lower extremity reconstruction is for trauma or for complications of trauma. We don't have as large of a practice in doing lower extremity free flaps for patients who have, you know, diabetic foot ulcers as they do at Georgetown. We obtain vascular imaging of the vast majority of our patients. A lot of patients who, you know, we think are high risk for having some type of intervenable pathology, we would request, you know, or sort of been flagged on, you know, screening like pulse exam or their ABIs, we would request a formal arteriogram with vascular surgery so they could undergo an intervention if needed. And then there's sort of a portion of patients who undergo a CT angio who are maybe sort of less high risk for those types of pathologies or more acute trauma patients. From this article, I think the authors obviously have a credible success rate with free flap reconstruction for these really high risk patients. I'm a little torn as to try to understand how this really changes our practice. You know, does this sort of just suggest that all of these types of patients should be undergoing formal arteriograms, or is there any type of information we can sort of glean from this that would suggest we have a low-risk population of patients that we could maybe screen from a slightly less invasive way? I don't know if this paper answers that for us. That's a great point. I mean, like you said, do we need to do this on every patient, and how do we really take this and streamline with, you know, the cost containment that healthcare is coming into? to manage costs because it does give you a roadmap, but it it comes at an expense. Raj, what are you doing in St. Louis for uh, lower extremity wounds? What's your workup? For us, we do a reasonable amount of limb salvage now for chronic wounds. The person that does it here was a Georgetown graduate a few years ago. So we probably do, I guess, maybe one flap a week, one or two flaps for diabetic feet and lower extremity wounds a week. And we don't get preoperative imaging on everybody. If we do, we prefer formal angiograms both for the reason Dr. Patel mentioned where you can do an arterial intervention, either a stent or an angioplasty if you need to, but also because I think you get better details on antigrade and retrograde flow as well as better details on venous outflow. And those are some things you can query a little better on a formal angiogram. But our mentality is if they have a clinical exam that is not consistent with peripheral vascular disease and no history, that they do not need formal imaging So for me, this paper actually was very interesting in the sense of that I'm not 100% sure what to do with the data that people who had normal exams were found, 15% of them, I think, in this study, were found to have diseased vessels on angiography, because that would indicate that, at least in our population that we treat here in St. Louis, there are patients that we're not getting imaging on because they have normal clinical exams, but they actually do have diseased or subclinical diseased vessels. So that's something that I I think is interesting. I haven't anecdotally had any issues with patients who've had normal palpable pulses, either PT or DP, and having issues on the table with vascular inflow. But certainly, you could argue, based on this study, that that it may become an issue as your volume increases. So I have a a question related to that point, Raj. I mean, you know, the authors here don't mention whether they 
got non-invasive imaging on those patients where they did find an arterial lesion despite what they thought was a, a normal exam. So that's why in my practice we get those non-invasive tests pretty much on everyone with a chronic lower extremity wound and that acts as the kind of screening test to see who does need invasive imaging. I agree 100% with that. We get ABIs and non-invasive studies on pretty much everybody that has a chronic lower extremity wound. A majority of those patients are diabetics in our population. So we are getting those studies on them. And then if they do have evidence of ischemia or peripheral arterial disease based on their ABIs or TBIs, then we will get a formal angiogram on them because that would be an indication in our population for potentially needing intervention before flap coverage. One of the other things I think was really interesting is, is just how they defined patients who had peripheral arterial disease or a history of it. I think it was based on just a chart review. So we're not even sure, I guess, based on this study, then if those patients had a clinically normal exam, you would assume that obviously they examined the patients and that they would have confirmed that they had clinically normal exams. But I think it's just based on a chart, retrospective chart review of a diagnosis of peripheral vascular disease. So that is something to take into consideration. And Dr. Patel, also, uh, you know, you mentioned you get, uh, you know, imaging studies for arterial inflow. Do you get ultracyrovene uh, evaluations of the uh, kind of venous outflow to select where you're going to plug into? Uh, what are your thoughts on, on that as well? The authors mentioned it briefly in the uh, discussion. Yeah, that's a good point. So in anyone with any history of DVT or anything suggestive of uh, venous thrombosis, I definitely do that. And then I also, on the chronic low extremity patients, from the physical exam, if there's any findings suggestive of venous disease, such as lipodermatosclerosis or a history of venous ulceration or active venous ulceration, I definitely get a venous duplex so we can evaluate the veins and, and find out if there's any uh, occult disease there. Just anecdotally speaking, Dr. Patel, what sort of percentage do you find that despite all of your preoperative workup, all of your imaging, you're in the operating room in a, a vessel that you thought, you know, based on a preoperative arteriogram had good flow, sort of is insufficient, and you have to, you know, rearrange your operative plan and think about going to a different set of recipient vessels? Good question. You put me on the spot there. You know, I can't immediately recall anyone where we had to bail out on using our initial planned recipient vessels. But I think that's probably because we're so liberal with our use of imaging. We have, a, we have a good idea when we get in there. And then obviously when you're examining that vessel, you can kind of get a sense before you even have to make an arteriotomy whether it feels like it's got a good pulse in it. But I don't recall in my practice needing to change because we are liberal with getting angiograms. So Dr. Patel, with being kind of more liberal with the imaging that you're getting, have you had any issues from the hospital system or things trying to control costs with doing all these imaging protocols? Or do you kind of have data that can support, you know, salvaging a lower extremity chronic wound, the cost savings? Like, have you had any issues from the hospital system in terms of the cost? Not at this time. It's interesting because this is a challenging problem, as you mentioned, Carl. And when I think about all of the patients that have been consulted on, particularly the inpatients with bad diabetic foot wounds, it almost seems to me that there's a, a large percentage or the majority of those patients, the overwhelming majority of these patients, don't end up getting any kind of flap for a variety of reasons, whether they've got you know a single vessel bypass that goes all the way down to a very distal vessel, maybe they've got many other major comorbidities and they don't want to go through with, with such an extensive procedure. And I think it's almost a case of saying the overall healthcare costs are maybe related to prolonged hospitalizations and multiple procedures during that prolonged hospitalization that leads to ultimately the same end result in comparison to just getting a single uh, imaging study. Yeah, I think it's a great point to bring up because like, like you mentioned, these patients who have these chronic wounds, they're in and out of the hospital, the ER, they're in wound care clinics, they're requiring a lot of investment financially from the healthcare system. And so it seems while the test does cost money, that if you can get the test to give you data, you can get the flap to survive, you can get them out of that loop of this chronic wound infection loop, they can eventually get out and it would ultimately save the system money in the long run. This is Raj. I agree with that, Kyle, and what Dr. Patel said as well. I think one of the other things to consider is, just from a cost standpoint, is even if some of these patients do progress to amputation, which in this study was around 10%, and I think in most people's practices, that's probably even higher as far as patients who you flap and still ultimately progress to getting an amputation, is that if you can do an arterial intervention, such as a stent or an angioplasty to improve flow, it could also help heal 
uh, the PKA wound or if they get an above knee amputation. So I think there's additional benefits on the patients that you get imaging on that you're able to intervene on, even if they do end up with an amputation. Just improving the vessels that are existing there can also help them heal and in other chronic wounds that are smaller that maybe don't require flap coverage, improving the arterial inflow can also help those wounds heal. So I think that's another benefit to consider downstream. That's a great point, Raj. And then kind of my offset on this, Dr. Patel, was what is your post-op management for lower extremities in terms of dangling when you let them ambulate? Is it the same as with an acute kind of traumatic lower extremity free flap or is it different? Do you treat them any differently? Well, I tend to treat the lower extremity free flaps that are not traumatic. We tend to try and get them dangling uh, sooner simply because I feel that they have the zone of injury from, a, from someone who has a bad lower extremity injury that needs a free flap kind of the whole leg is within the zone of injury. They have edema. We want to try and let that resolve a little bit before we start dangling them. Whereas the patients who have the free flaps for either oncologic defects or for chronic wounds don't tend to have the same degree of kind of edema and just disease of their whole leg. So I try and get them dangling at least by day seven. Day seven is normally kind of a good number for us and we get them dangling at that point. Then, of course, it depends on how they progress through the dangle. Many of these patients, I mean, every case is a little different in terms of whether it's on a weight-bearing surface or not. If it's not on a weight-bearing surface, of course, they're able to get up and walk much sooner than the patients who, who have to be uh, non-weight-bearing to allow for healing, If it's on, a, for example, if it's on a plantar surface. Gotcha. Lily, do you have the same kind of thing at Duke in terms of uh, difference between dangling for chronic lower extremity free flaps versus uh, acute? I know you don't have a ton of uh, uh, chronic wounds coming in for free flaps there, but um, any differences that you've noticed? You know, I haven't. Most of the chronic type wounds we do are sort of in the setting of previous surgeries or previous traumas. But, you know, in my experience thus far, I haven't really noticed a major difference in the dangling protocol, although I will confess that a lot of that has, in our practice at Duke, tends to be deferred to about two weeks post-op, and for the most part, the patients are out of the hospital, and so some of that does happen, you know, in the clinics that we are not, you know, don't have as much continuity of as, as we're aware of everything that happens in the hospital. And then Raj, same question, any difference now that you're doing, uh, you know, one or two free flops for chronic wounds a week, what is the dangling protocol there? Ours is quite similar to what Dr. Patel mentioned, and what I assume they do at Albany, where we start them early at usually seven days. That's also a, it's just an easy number for us to, and the residents to remember. So we start our, our acute and chronic wounds similarly. I do think that's an interesting point that Dr. Patel mentioned with the larger zone of injury and the larger impact of edema. Obviously, patients who have hardware and orthopedic issues from acute extremity wounds, we defer to orthopedics on weight-bearing status and also kind of involve them in the discussion as far as when to start dangling. But for most of our chronic wounds, we do start them at uh, seven days, and then we progress through the protocol. And then, obviously, if they have setbacks in the protocol, then we, we just drop them back to the previous day, and we usually do that for the next seven to ten days. And then if it's not on a plantar surface, we get them ambulating with assistance with physical therapy, ideally at two weeks, and if it's on a plantar surface, we usually hold off until they can be weight-bearing. And then a lot of that also depends on if they had osteomyelitis, their infection, and if they have any hardware or anything like that. Just one further question about getting arteriograms on these patients. As we as residents are sort of thinking about going out into the early portion of our career and being in our board collection period, I think one real benefit of this article is it sort of presents a very safe way of doing these types of reconstructions with very high levels of success in these high-risk patients. Do you think there, you know, can ever really be held against us or the decision-making is wrong to obtain a preoperative arteriogram in each of these patients? And, you know, especially as we're trying to just be safe in the beginning of our career before sort of dialing back some of these types of screening procedures? Well, I think one of the take-home points from this paper is that preoperative angiography is safe and does provide useful information. If we look in the, in the vascular surgery literature, we can see that when people have formal angiograms, yes, while there's documented complication rate, overall it's a relatively safe intervention. And I think that if you can make a case for it helping your decision making with regard to the procedure that you need to perform, then I think it's a very reasonable thing to do. I think with that, we will end the discussion of this article. Thank you, everyone, for a great discussion. If you like this podcast, please feel free to share with your colleagues and friends and rate us in the Apple iTunes store. Remember to tune into the other two articles that we will be discussing on this month's podcast. 
Go ahead and like the Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery Facebook page if you have not done so already, and join us later this month for our interactive real-time discussion with this February selected article authors. And once again, I want to thank Dr. Patel for joining us. Thank you for listening to the award-winning PRS Journal Club podcast. Be sure to read all of the articles being discussed, including some of the classic pairings from the archives, for free on prsjournal.com.